Kevin, thanks for joining us. Um, uh, how are you doing today? Doing great, man. Yeah. Doing really good. Good so, to be here. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the history of ADC Paving to start off with. Well, ADC Paving is in its 60th season, so that's pretty awesome going into 2019. Um, my wife's grandfather started the business in 1959. He ran it up until 1980 uh, when he passed. Uh, my wife's aunt took it over at that point. She ran it from 1980 to 2011. I came in and worked with her from 2009 to 2011, just learning the business, uh, learning a little bit more about the construction and asphalt and paving side of things. And we bought the company in 2011 and have been running it ever since. So that's that's the backstory, the history of the company. So Now, did you have plans to always take over the company or did you start working there first? At, at what capacity did you start with ADC? Well, we started, we knew we knew her aunt uh, at some point in the near future would be looking to sell. I don't know whether that would be, you know, shut the doors or sell it to another you know, another buyer or uh, something along those lines. So at that point, you know, she reached out to my wife's father, my father-in-law, and said, hey, you know, I'm looking to get out of the company in a couple of years. I'm, get, I'm get, looking to sell the business. And, you know, he kind of brought us to the table at that point and said, you know, my my son-in-law is, is looking to do something you know, a little more entrepreneurial. He's looking to get uh, into the construction field and, you know, thought that might be a op good opportunity. So he kind of put the two of us together. And uh, starting in 2009, I started, you know, working with my wife's aunt uh, in an effort to learn a little bit more about the business. I started basically just on the sales side, just trying to learn as much as I could as quickly as possible. I was at the office every day. You know, using her as a mentor, using others uh, locally in the industry as mentors, and just basically trying to gather as much knowledge as I could in a short amount of time, uh, because I knew it was inevitable at some point with with her health issues that you know either the doors were going to close or she would need a buyer. So, you know, I, I delved into it pretty deep and and learned as much as I could. I'm still learning every day. I'm I'm ten, ten years into this journey and um, certainly didn't know anything in 2011 when we bought the company. So it's it's been an ongoing uh, learning experience. Was it all on-the-job training or did you find any resources at first that were particularly useful? Yeah, I mean a lot of it was on-the-job training. You know, I, I spent um, several years out with with the crews just watching and observing and actually the, the first full year that we owned the company, we bought the company in July of 2011 and the first full year that we owned the company 2012, I actually spent every day out in the field on a paver, on a rake, on a roller, you know, learning as much as I could because, again, at this point, I didn't know anything. I said, and, I, and I had a, a great mentor of mine who's my wife's uncle down in Atlanta, Georgia, who's been who's been paving for about 30 years. He's got a very successful company. He said, you need to get out there in the field. You need to understand how this equipment works. You need to understand, you know, how the pavement works. You need to understand the tools, the tricks of the trade, you know, really start wrapping your brain around this. Um, so I dove in. Just by kind of observing you in the field, working with your crew, yep. um, it's pretty evident that they look to you um, as a leader, as someone who they can turn to for answers, and they really seem to enjoy working for the company. Were there any particular skills or resources? We'll, we'll stuck, stick with skills. Were there any particular skills that you feel like you needed to improve on, or were you just kind of a, always naturally that kind of leader? Well, I mean, I you know, I, I think, at least in a small business and maybe in all business, I mean, it's... You know, I, I think being in tune with your employees, whether you're a three-person company or, you know, even a 500-person company, I mean, um, you know, get to know these people, get to know their story, get to know, you know, their families and a little bit about them. I, I don't think you can really lead without having a, somewhat of a personal touch um, with with these people that you expect to respect you and work for you. I mean, I think it's important to kind of you know value the relationship and that that's a big part of why I love being an entrepreneur and owning a business it's uh, yes I am passionate about asphalt and, and pavements and and maintenance and things of that nature but it's it's really the people that that get me up every morning I mean it's it's getting an opportunity every day to lead these people and the way they've affected you know and changed my life and given me inspiration and um, is a big part of why I do what I do now, hiring people is one of the things that I've found, and it seems to be pretty common, as to be the biggest hurdle for entrepreneurs and business owners yep. is finding that, that right type of person. Sure. Um, besides the, the typical things like shows up to work on time and, and um, uh, 
being professional on site and things like that. Is there yeah. anything that you really look for when you're evaluating employees? Yeah, we do, and it's <clears throat> it's something that's been it's been a challenge in our business. I mean, we took a stance. You know, I'm ten years in. We took a stance. You know, two three years ago, and and although we knew it was going to be difficult and challenging and hard. Um, we decided that culture was going to be king at ADC. And we, we decided that no matter how much talent or how good a person is at what they do, if they don't fit, you know, we, we look at things like, what are your ethics? What are your morals? How are you raised? Um, all those things play a part. So it's, you know, and, and I'm, I'm to the point now in my career after doing this for 10 years that I would rather hire a person on their, on their values than I would their talents. You know, if we can find the right kind of people that fit our business model, uh, we can we can train them, and we will spend time training them. Um, from myself to our managers, uh, to our foreman, you know, I'm I'm all in for for training our people and getting them to where they need to be. Whether that be on site training, whether that be sending them to conferences, expos. Uh, I mentioned my my cousin down in Atlanta who's got a paving operation. I've taken guys down there, and he's allowed us to spend time with him and his crews. So. You know, we'll we'll do whatever it takes to get to get people up to the standard, but but primarily we hire you know people first and, and people with with values and ethics that align with ours, and and that's why I say a lot, you know, and the people that we pass on or let go or or decide are not a good fit for ADC does not mean they're not a good fit somewhere else. We just we just try to play by kind of a different set of rules and and raise the bar and and hire, you know, based on humanity over talent. Right. And have have you found any particular compared to when you first started? Have there been any particular challenges, um, whether it be not necessarily just on the hiring side, but were there any unexpected challenges that you've had yourself uh, had to find yourself trying to learn from or deal with when it comes to working with your employees? You know, ab- absolutely. I mean, that's. Um... My father-in-law used to say, you know, you own a business. He said the hardest part of it is going to be the employees and and that balance and and getting people that that come to work every day and show up on time and 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 care as much as you do. And you're never going to find anybody that cares as much as you do because, you know, they say, you know, if you want you want an employee to care as much as you do, give them fifty percent of the business. You know, make make them an owner and sure. and they'll start to understand. So, yeah, there's always challenges and. It, um, some of the biggest challenges were happened when we did decide to make that culture shift and start working on that was actually letting people go that we had relied on for years um, and figuring out, you know, okay, this guy isn't a good fit anymore. He's been here for six years. This is going to be tough. Uh, this is going to hurt. This is going to be, this is going to, you know, hinder our production. Um, how are we going to move on without th- this person or these people? And ultimately what I've found is nine times out of 10, you're better off, you know, bringing in people even with less experience that have, you know, this higher level of, of values and integrity. Um, and, we, and we keep the ball rolling smoother that way than, than relying on people that, that don't quite fit our vision. Sure. Um, now when, when either whether it be personal or professional, um, when struggles come along, when you find yourself in a situation where you need to regroup or think fairly fast, um, are there any tactics or resources or, or mental um, processes that you go through uh, when you need to take a, take a step back and, and, uh, but still evaluate things quickly? Well, I mean, yeah, there are. There are, there are things I try to do on a, on a daily basis that, that help keep me grounded because, you know, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, I mean, that that's kind of the role you take is you've got to make, you know, sometime, you know, multi-million dollar decisions in a split second or within, within a few seconds or um, how to keep your day's production going. Um, so, so a lot of times you are making, you know, big financial decisions on, on a whim. Um, you know, a lot of things I like to do is, that, you know, I try to keep my mental health in check. I try to keep my physical health in check. I, I try to get to the gym at least five days a week. Um, I listen to a lot of books on the way to the office in the morning and on my way home, just trying to ramp myself up for the day or kind of decompress after the day. And um, I, I found that you know staying level is has really helped me run a smoother operation. A lot of people, you know, have told me that you know kindness is a weakness, and I I, I try to always operate from from a level of 
a fairness and understanding um, to the most part, and it's um, it it can be challenging, but it's you know it's I, I do those things to try and stay just you know level in the day. And uh, you know that's that's a tough combination, you know, uh, with the stigma that kindness is a weakness. Yep. Um, but also running a you know a multi million dollar business. Sure. In the construction industry, there's a lot of times there's a there's a, a stigma or a preconceived notion that um, people are out to make a quick buck, get the job done, um, yep. and then and then get out of there. I know you're working towards uh, establishing lasting relationships. Sure. Um, how, how have you tried to to further that mission and let clients know that that you're there to support them even after the job is already done? Yeah, I mean that's that's something that that we really believe in, and I think that's something that sets us apart. I hope that it sets us apart. It's something that I'm very passionate about, and we, you know, we kind of trickle it through the whole organization is is operating with integrity, which in short term means doing the right thing when no one's watching. So. We go out every day, you know, um, of course, you know, we build a profit margin in each job and yes, we are in the business of making money, but at the end of the day, it's not the money that drives me and it's not the money that drives the company. It's, it's serving the community. It's doing something we're passionate about. Um, and it's, it's honoring our word to our customers because at the end of the day, you know, all these people that you see, they don't work for me. We all work for our customers. So that's at the end of the day, that's the most important thing that we have are those customers. So it's our duty to take care of them, to be fair with them, to offer them real solutions, to educate them on processes, um, you know, give them upfront, you know, costs and good estimates. And, and you know, we, do, we do our best not to incur many change orders, though they do happen sometimes on the back end. I mean, we, we like to shoot, you know, from the hip, from the beginning. So that's, I think that's huge. I mean, I think we owe that to our customers uh, to be upfront and full you know, fully transparent all the time. Yeah, I, I've, I've noticed that, and I've noticed um, how much that your clients, at, through the process, they'll be out there with you oh, yeah. on the job site, yep. and and afterwards they'll they will definitely talk about you know how much they ad- admire how you know how you go about things. You talked about communicating and educating your um, potential clients. Yep. Um, you know, starting off. Explain a little bit about when you first started, how you gain customers, and then you know talk to them about your all's values, and then maybe how you're trying to do that going forward, how you're trying to reach them and, and put that ADC brand in front of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think back in the early days, at least when I first um, took over the business, I mean, <clears throat> I always had a vision of growth. You know, we, we've over the years, over the 50 years before we took ownership, I mean, this, this company was, was a residential, you know, company and that's uh, all it did mainly was, was driveway work and, and residential work. And, um, I always had a vision of being, you know, more than that, uh, getting into the commercial realm and, and really providing, you know, large scale, you know, customer satisfaction and service, um, and kind of a maintenance plan for these larger customers. Um, so in the beginning, I mean, I was gung ho. Like I was wanting to just sell everything, every job, every driveway, every every time the phone rang, I was like, "Let's go get it." You know, we need to we need to get our revenue up. Um, you know, the company was doing about five or six hundred thousand when I bought it. And I was like, "We're going to do a million. We're going to do a million. Well, we did a million two the first year and. Uh, really, really stretched ourselves too thin. I mean, we we had no business doing over a million that first year uh, with, with you know, just the way the crew was set up, the way our equipment was set up, our trucks, our office staff couldn't handle it. Um, so we've learned a lot over the years on how to how to pace that growth, um, and we've also learned that not every job is a good job. You know, there's there's certain jobs that we're not good at, and we don't need to entertain and. Yes, that customer may be willing to sign on the line, but we got to understand sometimes, you know, we've got to walk away from jobs that we know we can't provide the value or service that that customer may be expecting. So <clears throat> we really want to be straightforward with what we're capable of. We want to be straightforward with customers' expectations along with the expectations of ourselves that, yes, we can do this job well and give them a product that they want. So I think you know, over the 10 years, it's gone from hustle, 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 sell, sell, sell. Every job's a good job. 
every customer is a good customer. Well, that's not always the case. I mean, we, we have kind of specific customer base that, that appreciates what we do. And I think what we do is go a little step further than most. And we may be a little more expensive, but I think now, you know, we, we do operate with the customer's best interest in mind. So where competitor may come out and say, well, we can do this for this and, you know, we can patch this and, you know, and, and, and kind of blow smoke and kind of false promises to the customer and, and give them a, a product that may last a year or two. We know that's not right because for a little more money, you know, we can provide a lot better service, a lot better in product, you know, by doing things right. And it's our job to educate the customer on what the difference is and, and kind of a, you know, a sloppy temporary fix or something that's going to last, you know, for 20 years. So, and if, and if, we, and if we run into customers that, that don't necessarily want to go that route, that's fine too. They're just not a good customer for us and that's okay. So we've, we found our niche, we found our lane, we found customers that, that we mesh with and, and that's what we deliver on. And for those people that might be watching out there that are having trouble generating leads or finding the right groups to be a part of, I know there's there's plenty of different methods to try to gain business. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there either perhaps a strategy that you would recommend or definitely some some, some things you, you don't want to do when sure. uh, approaching a potential client? I mean, I'm... It, it goes back to the old times and, you know, our father said it, our father's father said it. And at the end of the day, it's, you've just got to outwork your competition. You, I mean, you just got to work harder. If you want, if you want to grow your business, if you want to find more customers, I mean, you got to put in the time. It's, they're not going to come to you. They can, they can go on Google and find, you know, 10 other paving contractors that probably have some decent reviews and look okay on the internet. You know, it's, um, we, we still do a lot of cold calling. We still, you know, pound a lot of pavement and knock on doors. And, you know, we, we go after, you know, we know the clients that we want and we, we spend a lot of time, you know, doing that. So I think at the end of the day, it's just, it's just putting in the work, you know. And I know that you had said you originally started off with driveways, yep. you know, when the company started. Uh, over the past couple of years, you all have made a major shift into the commercial side of things. So oh, instead yeah. of dealing with homeowners, mm -hmm. You're dealing with business owners, yep. uh, property managers, facilities managers. Um, how has your approach changed uh, when dealing with someone that owns a driveway as a, as opposed to absolutely people that own those businesses? Yeah, I mean we we've had to we've had to up our game. We've had we've had to um, myself, our estimators, our foreman, um, our office staff. I mean we've all on, undergone. You know, we're always, we've gone through training, we've gone to conferences, uh, we've taken classes. We're always, you know, sharing articles and, and things with each other. I mean, the game has totally changed. I mean, when you when you step from a, a $2,500 customer to a quarter million dollar customer, I mean, you owe them a lot more service. You owe them a lot more education. You owe them a lot more project management. You owe them a lot more, you know, email correspondence, communication, planning. I mean, so there's, there's a there's a big piece that goes into that. So that's, that that's kind of why I I lend caution to some of these people that get in business, especially in construction, that say, hey, we're going to grow our business. We're going to, you know, we're going to go from five hundred thousand. We want to be a five million dollar company. I mean. That's great. That's what we want to do. I mean, we're we're trying to get into that five to ten million dollar um, level, also. But it's you have to have a strategy because when you start hitting that sales button and all these jobs start coming in, you better be able to to perform and you better be able to perform well and and have the support, you know, from the crew to your equipment to your office staff to be able to do that. I mean, our first couple of years, we we took on you know couple, you know, five, six, seven hundred ton jobs that we had no business in doing. And, and we lost money on every one of them, every one of them. Um, and so, and then, and then we had, I mean, even, even, even our driveway work was getting bad because we were trying to do too much. You know, we were, instead of going, you know, we, we've got to do, you know, in the past two driveways a day. Well, if we want to get to this number and we want to be this kind of company, we got to do X amount of dollars a day. Now we got to do three, four, five driveways a day. Well, by the time your crew gets to the third, fourth, fifth driveway, when they're used to doing two, they're tired. You know, they're they're like, what are we doing? Um, and and so there's the the quality can can really suffer when you try to grow 
exponentially fast. I mean, you really better have your your seat in your pants, you know, buckled up if if you're ready to go. So, I I recommend. I mean, this may not be for everybody. I recommend you know kind of just a a plan, uh, a paced plan in action and and a well developed business strategy when you're ready to start taking things to the next levels. And as you're growing. <laughs> Obviously, it, it takes a team and it takes the people in the field, yep. uh, you know, the, the manpower to be able to do this. What would you say if someone's looking to grow and they could either buy equipment, hire people, um, office yep. management? What What are some of the more valuable things to have that backbone really in place? It's, it's the people. I mean, it's, you know, I, I may own the business. I may be the face of the business. I may be the one that, that has all the risk uh, involved, but I am nothing without those people. I mean... Caterpillar or, or Brandeis or any of these guys selling equipment. I mean, I, the equipment is the equipment. The trucks are the trucks. The tools are the tools. I mean, anybody in the world can go get that stuff and get in the paving business. It's, sure. I mean, it's the people. Um, and it's finding, you know, for me, I mean, who kind of started with just one crew and one person in the office basically just answering the phone. I mean, I was running a majority of the sales calls. My brother-in-law and I were. Um <clears throat> But you've got to start incrementally, you know, finding kind of your right hand man out in the field. You got to find your left hand is that person in the office that's going to kind of help you run the operations. This guy's going to kind of help you run the field. And then what we found is that, you know, we've got to start getting other guys in the field also who have leadership mentality and accountability and just, you know, because I can't do it myself. This left hand person of mine can't do it theirself. This right hand guy of mine you know, can't do it himself. It takes every one of us. And it's, I mean, it's a total team effort every day. And as I said, that's evident whenever you're around, you're either in the office or in the crew. Um, I got to go yesterday and, and see where you're working. And yep. um, yeah, it is a uh, well-oiled machine, even in the off season. I can only imagine sure, yeah. what, it's, yeah. what, what it's like in the office it's during nuts. the season. Yeah. Taking a step back a little bit before you got in, into, into paving, um, what are some of your previous life experiences that that you would say either taught you a lesson or, or have definitely benefited you um, to, at this point. Well, I mean, I mean, there's several. I've I've, <laughs> I've lived a crazy life. Um, I've had, it's been, you know, full of personal challenges and, um, you know, I, I, most most people don't talk about you know a lot of their personal life you know openly. But you know, I I think if we're sitting here talking and you want to get to know Kevin Gray and what what has kind of made him who he is. I mean, I'll go back, I mean, 15 years of my life, I fought yeah. alcoholism and drug addiction. Wow. I mean, and that, <clears throat> to me, to me, living with that and fighting that um, for years and understanding it and understanding um, who I am, who I was, who I want to be, you know, going, going through countless um, therapy sessions, you know, I learned a lot about people and psychologies and learned a ton about myself um, and ultimately have, have learned that, you know, after living that and for so many years, I mean, finally, finally getting that breakthrough moment uh, just a few short years back of what life can be like without it is, I mean, it's amazing. And it's just, it's almost given me new life and new appreciation for life and new motivation. Um, so I, I think that's the single biggest thing in my life that that keeps me going is is how I feel today and and what I've learned you know from all those years. I mean, people that that deal with you know with with addiction or depression or anxiety. I mean that stuff is. I mean it's no joke. I mean ment mental health issues and, and addictions and, and abuse and things like that. I mean they're 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 a serious problem in this country. I mean there's there's so many people that keep that stuff behind closed doors. I mean I'm. I'm proud that I've gotten beyond that, and I, you know, I don't mind sharing that a bit because that's that's a big part of who I am. It's a big part of who I was. It's a big part of someone who I'll always be, um, w whether I choose to let it rear its head or not. You know, so absolutely. Well, uh, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, and if you know, please don't. You don't have to answer anything that that, that makes you uncomfortable. But no. um, that that first moment when you realized um, <clears throat> that there that there was a problem. Yeah. What, what was that like and, and how did that happen? It, I mean, it, um, 
I, I knew for a year. I mean, it probably, you know, it started in my in my late teens. Um, and I, I guess I didn't really realize it was a problem until I got um, involved in a relationship with my wife, who is, God bless her, is still with me through. She, she endured quite a few of those years with me. And, you know, that speaks a lot about her character and, and not giving up and, and, you know, staying true to a commitment. And that's... Um, I don't know if she knows it enough, but that's been a huge part um, in my life too, as far as you know, understanding compassion and and second chances and you know, kind of commitment to someone or a commitment to a cause or accountability to someone else. So, you know, it, it was probably you know several years in, into our relationship that where she was having enough of this shit. And it, you know, it's like, dude, you gotta you gotta get this because I. It's hard to explain, you know, the disease to people that, that haven't lived it or understand it. So you almost think like you're not, you know, it's it's normal because it's just what you do, you know. So you don't, I don't even think you have an awareness of it until you really start seeing the damage it's causing to, to people in your life that care a lot about you, you know. So um, she, without her, I don't, I don't know that I would have ever gone and gotten help. And I, you know, it, it took two, three, four I don't know, five times of, of trying to do some therapy and, and going to see people and, you know, detoxing and, you know, whatever. I mean, it, it didn't happen overnight. It wasn't one time she said, Hey, you got a problem. It, it was a period of years and, and mistakes and, and letting people down. And, you know, that really I f something finally clicked and it, you know, thank God it did because, you know, I was on a path to death and destruction probably. So that's uh, an incredible story, and, and you know, congratulations on on your success well, thanks, and, and yeah. getting through that so far. Um, so far, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's let's one let's, day at a time, man. That's you right. Know. So, um, for the, for those that might might not be as, as fortunate to to have someone as supportive as your wife, or yep. um, you know, may not have um, you know the family or, or 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 know where to start. Is there is there is there something you would recommend doing, reading, watching, reaching out? Um. Yeah, I mean, there's there's great groups all over Louisville. It's actually it's actually one of the largest uh, AA communities in the nation. So there is uh, there's help out there. Um, you know, it, if you can confide in a, you know, it, it it takes a lot. And this is something I that that I learned a lot. You know, through the project. This goes for people with <clears throat> all kinds of mental illnesses, but it takes a lot for you to admit that you have a problem because. You know, as humans, we're pretty damn prideful people. So it, you know, it, it takes a lot just to step up and say, hey, time out, I need some help. You know, so whether you've got a family member or a friend or a co-worker, somebody that you can lean on, just say, hey, I need, you know, can you help me find a place? Can you help me find a therapist? Can you help me, you know, whatever. Um, I think that's really the first step is is getting some help and then, and then after that, you know, what's, what's helped me is, I mean, I've read a, a ton of books that have just helped me, you know, better understand myself and better understand life. And, and uh, so it, it's a journey for sure. Excellent. I, th I think the biggest thing, you know, is if, if you're feeling you, you need, you know, some help or having issues, is just finding somebody to reach out to. Because it's lonely. Right. It's a scary place. So Right. Just summon that courage to take the first step. And Yep. I know that it is a journey. Yep. Um, <clears throat> wow, that's uh, well, that's you know, that's even more um, more impressive that you're you're able to to make this and make this this company, this paving company, go through the success that it has. Yeah. So back to we'll, we'll say the, <clears throat> the the company side of things. Um, what, what's it like dealing with? Obviously, you were fortunate to have kind of a system in place there with ADC. You know, something you could really dig into yep. and learn. What is it like? Starting that journey off with family, like working with family. It was crazy. Um, it was crazy. Um, you know, it's there's there's definitely a different dynamic. You know, people talk about all the time about how working with family has its challenges and it's unique. And I, I think, you know, from the research I've done, there are very few family businesses that, that sustain themselves. Or I mean, and they do, but it's... There, there's just a totally different level of uh, the business never stops. Uh, when you've got your brother-in-law or your father-in-law or whoever over 
for dinner or you all go out to eat or it's Christmas or it's Easter. We're always talking asphalt. I mean, it's nonstop in your face and it's, it's basically the topic of conversation all the time. So, um, very fortunate to have both my brother-in-law and father-in-law in the business at the time they were. I mean, they were both, you know, a huge part of getting us where we are today. So without them, we wouldn't be ADC as, as we know it, because I think my brother-in-law was eight or nine years part of that, of that build of that building years, you know, and, and good for him. He, he decided a couple years back, he wanted to go out on his own and, and try some of his entrepreneurial spirit. And that's, you know, I, I was I was glad to write him a thirty thousand dollar check of commission that I owed him and, and wished him good luck. So it was cool how that worked out. And <clears throat> father in law finally stepped out uh, a couple years back and and has been able to travel the country uh, in an RV. So he's finally enjoying some retirement. So that's a goal I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, I think I think everything you know kind of had their had their place and time uh, for us to be you know on this journey. So. Very, very unique, though. Very yeah, I, I started my, my journey um, probably about eight years ago with audio engineering school, and then just a couple years ago started the media company. Yep. And once I started it and you realize that it's on you, you know, especially when you're the leader, yes. um, You it's pretty much on your brain nonstop. It is. Now, <clears throat> when you've had a particularly busy day or week or you're getting ramped up for the season, when you leave the office... How do you turn it off and get into to husband and dad mode? Well, e- either it's um, it's usually some some music. Just if I can just, I've got about a thirty minute drive home most days. So if it's if I'm not so worn out from the day that that I you know I don't feel like putting an audio book on and listening to that on the way home, I'll just I'll find some good jams and I you know I will crank that shit. You know you know <laughs> I will I will sing out loud in my truck on the way home and just kind of shift, you know, into dad mode. But, you know, even even when I get home sometimes, I mean, it's I've got to do a better job sometimes of, of setting it aside when I get home because um, as much as I want to do this 24-7 and have a great deal of passion for it, I mean, there's my family at home is the reason I do all this. I mean, it really is. So those three people are what – those three people and – the 20 people at ADC, that's what gets my ass up out of bed every morning, right? So I owe that to my wife and my children when I get home. I said, you know, that's, that's their time. These 20 people have gotten their time me today. Sure. Now it's your time, you know, and that's, you know, I, I try to try to get as much of that family time in as I can because those years are going so fast with the kids. I mean, I've got, luckily got a 17-month-old again, um, got an eight-year-old that seemed like he was 17 months old just a few days ago so it's you know cherish those moments man is there uh is there anything outside of besides like the daily life obviously you all have a uh a rather extended off season now you all are seem like you're working seven days a week for 25 hours a day in season yes so how do you find yourself rewarding yourself rewarding your family you know um for all the hard work uh, when you do get a couple days off or in the off season, yeah, well, we, you know, we try to at least go s- somewhere over the winter for at least a week or so to to relax as a family. We're getting an opportunity that this off season uh, we didn't last year with with the newborn, so hopefully we can get some R and R and and recharge the batteries and and make some family memories. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's and, and I work, you know, although we work. You know, at least myself and some of the key players and management work all winter long. I mean, we do have a more relaxed schedule. You know, we'll we'll work you know a few less hours a day, or maybe you know only work three days a week where we actually come into the office. Although we may be kind of working from home on other days, but you know, I, I'm a human too, and I, I appreciate everything that, especially these you know management people do for us all season long. That that we all try to take some time. We shut down for two weeks over the holidays. I mean, entirely shut down. Um, so all those people are getting two weeks off, paid vacation kind of stuff. And um, definitely a, a much more relaxed schedule for all of us in the winter because we do. I mean, we go from March 1 till you know, at least December 1, December 15th. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Um, you know, you've basically got to produce a year's worth of a revenue and, and net income in a nine-month window, and it's it's a challenge, but 
but we got the right people, so we we go get it. So you're you're coming up on the next season. Yep. What's uh? Do you have any specific either changes that you'd like to implement, or maybe things you'd like to try this year? You know, especially looking more into the the next couple years, something new that you're just going to experiment with and 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 see if you can either bring in more business or bring more quality. We are well. I mean, one one big piece of that is what you and I are doing. I mean, I think. You know, bring it, bringing on a, a full full time kind of marketing agency to, to help grow our businesses is is, is going to be a big piece of that. We're 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 in that spot now. We're you know we're trying to to transition from a residential company um, to basically a full full time commercial business, and and residential business is still about forty percent of our of our overall revenue. So you know that's going to be a challenge in itself, but we're you know, we, we've invested in, in a, about all the equipment we can invest in at this point and, and this size. We've got all the trucking we need. Uh, I'd say we need a few more key people in the field and possibly in the office. Um, you know, we've hit a home run with, with the estimator that we hired. So that's, we're, we're getting a lot of the pieces together. I mean, it's, I mean, it's really ramping up and coming together, I mean, especially the last, probably the last two years. I mean, it, <clears throat> you can kind of see all the all the hard work and the sacrifices we made and committing to that culture change three years back is, you know, we're three years into it, but a mentor of mine over Louisville Paving said they decided to make a culture change. It took them nine years for that culture change to happen. And he said, we left money on the table. We had to let good people go. Uh, there were years we lost money, but now look at them. They're a $150, 200000000 million dollar major construction company and one of the biggest players in our region and they run a great operation so you know we can take lessons from our mentors and those that have done it before us and 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 pay attention and and kind of take this thing slow although there may be some discomfort um that's that's kind of our plan and uh, there's a you speak of like another company that that's here locally in yep. town um there's a lot of people that operate their business with the mentality that you don't want to share any of your information that that the, it's a it's a battle it's a competition for yep. each job yep. how has that worked as far as seeking mentorship from another company but also realizing that there there might be enough work for both of you well yeah i mean i you know i have a, a great mentorship with with joe doherty louisville paving um Bill Reed and, and a couple other guys over at Flynn Brothers have, have been great with me and ADC over the years. And, and those are the, you know, the two primary large paving contractors in Louisville. They're the ones that we buy all of our material from. Um, and they've always had an open door to, to giving me some mentorship or, you know, those, those guys that own those big companies, for them to take a five minute phone call for me, that's a big deal. I mean, that's, their days are planned, you know, like this. And for them just to give me you know, the, the time and, um, you know, Joe calls me once or twice a year and just, and, and has, has the time for me to say, you know, good job. I, I see what you're doing with ADC. And, uh, 10 years ago, you didn't know, sh man, it's, it's really cool to see you come this far. So <clears throat> I'm all about, you know, if it's good for the industry, it's good for ADC. So if the three of us, uh, you know, are all and we, and we all compete on jobs on a daily basis um, and I if, if any of the three of us get it I'm happy because I know that customer is going to get a good product and, and to me that's all that matters because sure. the guys that aren't willing to deliver a good product or, or represent themselves with integrity or you know do what they say they're going to do for the customer those guys are eventually going to weed themselves out anyway over time so I think in most markets um, there's plenty for everybody to eat if you're doing the job, you know, the right way and giving the customer what they pay for. So I'm all for the industry. Well, that's great. Yeah, that's uh, that's refreshing. A little friendly competition and, yeah. uh, on some jobs and, and things yep. like that. Yep. Just a, a few more questions to wrap up here. Do you have any specific goals as far as type of people you'd like to meet or specific types of jobs or challenges that you're looking forward to, hopefully to continually have over the next couple of years? Well, I mean, you know, the, some of the coolest things that I've encountered over the last year or two is, 
has kind of been the social media boom with and some of the guys I've met through that. I mean, it's it's amazing how many, and it gives me hope for the industry. There's so many like-minded people that, that kind of share some of the same vision and values and want the same thing. So that's, I mean, that's been a great um, community of people of, of friendships, of partnerships, of colleagues, you know, a platform for us to share ideas and for all of us to, to grow our businesses. Um, you know, the goal, the goal for me and the goal for ADC is, has been the same for several years. And it's to become, you know, we may not ever be the biggest because it's likely we'll never own an asphalt plant in Jefferson County, but our goal is to become the best paving and pavement maintenance contractor in Kentucky, if not the region, if not the nation. I mean, I just, I, I want, you know, this, this logo to be synonymous with those guys are the best. I mean, those, you know, you pull up to an ADC job and you're like, holy shit, it looks good. Because, you know, p paving, <laughs> paving is not a beautiful art. I mean, it's, it's rocks, sand, and tar that you put down on the ground and you, you hope looks good. Well, you can put it down and it can look like crap, but it's still in the last 20 years. But I want to put that thing down, and I want it to look like glass. I mean, I want it to be, I want it to just pop. Um, I, t I take a great amount of pride in what we do from e even still our, our residential jobs that are, you know, $2,000 customers. I want that damn thing perfect. You know, I just, I do. I do. If we're going to put our name on it, it better look good. You know, so that's, that's my goal is to keep doing great work. Um, always continue to raise the bar of quality in our standards uh, within myself and within our team. And I, I think if we do those things that the rest will fall in place, you know, um, I've never once done this for the money, you know, yes, I hope to make some money. I mean, there's reasons I work 80, 90 hour weeks. I mean, sure. it's, it's not all, you know, for, for the passion. I do, I do want to provide a, a nice life for my family, but you know, it's not, it's not about the money at the end of the day. It's about, you know, our passion, um, it's providing the utmost quality. It's about providing that customer experience that they deserve, uh, and it's it's becoming the best. I mean, I'm not I'm not doing this to be just a good paving contractor. I'm doing this to be the best paving contractor, and and luckily we've got a lot of team members you know on our side that have that same vision. So that's you know I I grew up um, I wrestled you know in in, in high school and in college, and that's um, it's very much an independent sport because you're out there on the mat, you know, with with just you and one other guy. But you know, you're also you have a team that that you feel that you're responsible to. So, and it you know you always want to win. You always want to be the best. So, I mean, I don't I don't play for second place. <laughs> <laughs> I guess is what I'm saying. I mean, it's kind of like if I'm if I'm gonna do it, let's do it. You know, that's great and, and you talked about that um, that motivation those things that keep you going you said uh, there was books and music and uh, podcasts yep. and things like that is there a specific book that you would recommend or is there a specific um, uh, motivator or speaker or podcast that you listen to that seems to be fairly consistent and, and, uh, and keeping you going there I mean Jocko Willink and Andy Frisilla get get my heart going every time I put them on um, so yeah, I mean th those those guys kind of operate from the same mantra that I that kind of gets me psyched up. So that you know that always works for me. And, uh, and what do what do they do? I mean, what besides these are podcasts? I assume these are podcasts. Um, Jocko's written some books. He's he's an ex ex military guy. He does you know a lot on leadership, and um, his book Extreme Ownership is is one that really <clears throat> clicked with me last year, and it's basically you are responsible for everything you do. If you want to take extreme ownership of something, at the end of the day, it's it's on you. There's no excuses. There's no, I'll get to it tomorrow. There, you know, it's kind of just that drives home that extreme ownership means doing what you say you're going to do, when you're going to do it. it. You know, it it just, it's kind of the ultimate rule book for accountability. Sure. So <clears throat> that got my check. Um, Andy Priscilla owns... Um, you know, a sports nu nutrition brand with products, but he's also got a podcast called the MF CEO Project, which is, it's basically just, you know, MF is motherfucking CEO. Um, so it's basically just kind of pumps you up as, as an entrepreneur. And, and, it, and again, it's, it's kind of 
and accountability, no excuses. Um, when, and that, and that, that kind of just clicked with me a couple years ago as, <clears throat> as the leader is you can't, you can't, you know, if you say you're going to be at the office at six, you better be at the office at six because somebody's going to see you weren't there at six and they're going to think that's okay. And well, you know, the boss, the boss is doing things that he said he wasn't going to do or isn't doing things that he said he was going to do. So if I'm going to lead by example, I, you know, I've got to set the utmost and whatever I want an employee to look like, I better be willing to do the same damn thing. Sure. Yeah, or if not even to a higher level, just sure. to kind of drive the point home. So, you know, those, those two get me going. Um, there's a book I love, the, the damn title of it's, uh, oh, Endurance. It's by, um, it is a, <clears throat> the, uh, the author is slipping me now, but, um, we can put it in the notes. Alfred, Sh I think it's Shackleton. I can maybe, um, it's Shackleton's Voyage. Um, it's when him and a group of men get trapped in the Antarctic on a, on a ship back in hmm. early 1900s. They're, they're uh, explorers. And it's just, I mean, it's their story of survival. And it's, I mean, it's, it's killer. Uh, right. And it's the title's endurance. And it's, it, just, and it, it just goes to show you, you know, you think you're, you're having a bad day because you're stressed out at work. Well, this guy just lost his foot because it rotted off because he's been frozen for three months straight, you know, but he's still going. Sure. So it's just, it's all about, it's a lot about it is about perspective. And, um, you know, we are, we are much more powerful as human beings than we think we are. I mean, our capabilities can far exceed, you know, what we think we're capable of if we just put our mind to something. I mean, I, I think there's that crazy saying that we only use like 10% of our, our brain or our natural given strength or, you know, whatever. So it's like, it, it's in there. It's, it's, and it's, it's tapping into that and, and pushing through and, you know, doing a little bit extra. Perseverance. Perseverance. Uh, yeah. Perseverance and perspective. Yeah. Uh, yep. <laughs> once you realize that uh, you're not having such a bad day compared to some people that have really gone through some oh, hardships, yeah. Uh, yeah. that makes a world of difference. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to get into a, to a damn political debate or anything, but you know, you, you've got children who are walking 2000 miles from Mexico, just trying to get to our country. Now, whether, whether you agree, whether they should be able to come in or not, it's a different story. But I mean, these are six, seven year old children that are walking thousands of miles through the desert right. and you're pissed because you spilled your fucking Starbucks. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> it's all relative. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like that's right. 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 Coffee, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's going have to change shirts before it, the interview. Yeah. It's, it's just, and I, I think sometimes that, that grounds me a little bit is, is taking a step back and having a little perspective. You know, you asked earlier, like, what are some of the things that I do when I'm in a tough situation? And, and a lot of times it's all it is. It's taking two minutes put myself in the moment thinking about you know most of the time we've been here before something similar to this has happened you know what are we going to do now and, and a lot of the times in construction and project management especially when you get into these large commercial jobs I mean things are going to happen that are out of your control they just are so it's basically you know how can you how do you adapt on the fly what's your what are your you know problem solving skills and and nine times out of ten, you know the answer. You just gotta, you gotta take a minute to find it. All right, so we'll, we'll end on with with one more question, and that's just um, whether it be a source of motivation or, or just simply a message that you wish um, more people um, thought about on a daily basis. If if um, everyone everyone in the in the nation could or in the world, whatever kind of scope you want to put on it, yep. would read one message every day. Uh, what do you think that that one message would be for you? Um, I, I mean, I think just just be grateful for your opportunity to wake up breathing, just to wake up in the morning. I mean, you know, every, everybody's in in different situations and different socioeconomic circumstances, and but do, you know, be grateful that you have a chance and just and do something that you love doing because life's too short not to. You know, absolutely. Yeah. Kevin Gray, thank you very much. I thank appreciate you, you coming on to the handshake. You got it, man. Hey, thanks for your time. And, uh, yeah, I, I can't wait to see what uh, the future holds for both you and ADC. Yeah, likewise, man. All right, thanks, Kevin. Thank you.